During the 1880s, mental hospitals across the United States, known as insane asylums, were treating individuals with extreme measures, sometimes bordering on abusive treatments. As a result, Nellie Bly, a young journalist in the state of New York, entered a woman's asylum as an undercover reporter to investigate and report on the abusive conditions. Bly's series of articles in 1887 about her experiences led to public awareness, better conditions, and successfully helped change the tragic treatment of mentally ill patients. In the Victorian era of the early 1800s, a woman in the United States could be considered unbalanced or mentally unstable due to a variety of causes, including pregnancy-related sadness, disobedience, and anxiety. In earlier years, people who dealt with mental illnesses were placed in institutions similar to prisons and jails. There were rules like not being able to leave, harsh conditions, and cruel treatments. Placing the mentally ill in facilities allowed people outside of the asylum to ignore the situations going on behind closed doors. A person committed to an institution back then would most likely never be seen again to share the experience or tell of the treatments. This would all change in 1887 when Nellie Bly, a young reporter for the New York World, went undercover as a patient to investigate the conditions in a New York asylum. Born in 1864 in the small town of Cochrane Mills, Pennsylvania, the young Elizabeth Cochrane had a great early life. Unfortunately and unexpectedly, her father died in the early summer on July 19, 1870, where she was barely six years old. After her mother remarried a ghastly man, she promised herself that she would help by gaining an education so her mother would never have to rely on abusive men. When she came of age, she enthusiastically enrolled in a private school in Indiana, Pennsylvania, now the University of Pennsylvania, one of the 12 schools in the state dedicated to preparing teachers and businessmen. Before finishing her first term, she was told she had to leave the school for financial reasons. Following this early rejection, she moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and began reading articles written for the Pittsburgh Dispatch, which sparked her interest in journalism. In her articles, Cochran used the pen name Nellie Bly, which originated from a Stephen Foster song. Bly authored her first article for the Pittsburgh Dispatch in 1885 in response to an article entitled, What Girls Are Good For? The article, What Girls Are Good For, centered on the opinion that women were made for two things, birthing babies and tending to the house. She wrote a rebuttal to this idea by saying that women and girls deserve the same treatment as men, and that they are good for other things than birthing babies and tending to the house. If girls were boys, quickly it would be said, start them where they will, if ambitious, win a name and fortune. How many wealthy and great men could be pointed out who started in the depths, but where are the many women? Girls are just as smart, a great deal quicker to learn. Why, then, can they not do the same? Following her early success in writing about topics such as divorce, poverty, discrimination, and the poor treatment of female factory workers, she lost interest in writing because, unfortunately, she was told to write about things like flowers, hair, and life in Pittsburgh. Eventually, she left the Pittsburgh Dispatch at the end of 1885 and began to write on a freelance basis. In 1887, Bly left Pittsburgh for New York City and went to work for Joseph Pulitzer's New York World. To an outsider viewing her story, it may seem as though Nellie Bly secretly ran away to Blackwell's Asylum located on Blackwell's Island in the East River in New York City. However, in truth, she was hired by New York World Publishing Company to investigate the conditions inside the asylum. In order to expose asylum conditions, she was willing to go insane. Before Nellie entered the asylum, she was faced with the difficult task of learning how to act as an insane individual. She would practice insanity to deceive the clinicians that she would come in contact with. She then proceeded to present herself at a temporary woman's shelter at Bellevue Hospital in New York City with the undercover name Nellie Brown, where she faked a mental breakdown. She was able to get all the doctors to confirm that she was mentally ill, except for one kind-hearted woman named Mrs. King, who said Bly was as courageous as she was good-hearted. Even though Mrs. Kane said what she did, Bly was still thought to be insane. She also continued to project her image of the poor loon by managing to have a sleepless night. The next morning, she was taken by two policemen to a courtroom to confirm if she was mentally insane or not. She ended up meeting a familiar face, the policeman she had interviewed a few days before taking action on her plan. He did not recognize her, relieving of her anxiety of being caught. She was pronounced positively demented by the court. After another restless night at the woman's shelter, she was finally taken by boat to Blackwell's Island on September 26, 1887, 
Located on an island in the East River, the Asylum for Insane Women was isolated from the outside world, making it even more difficult to expose what was happening. While on her way there, just to convince them even more of her insanity, she continued to say that she had a terrible headache that made her forget things. One of the first things Blind noticed while in the asylum was that poor individuals had admitted themselves because they were penniless and had nowhere else to go. Even if they weren't insane, they did not have many other options. While at the asylum, Bly was humiliated by the nurses and given freezing baths. She had three buckets filled with ice-cold water poured over her and felt as if though she was being drowned. All the inmates would bathe in the same disgusting thick water, dry off with the same towel, and use the same comb. There would be about 300 women who would occupy their barred hall, one to ten women staying in one room. The nurses would threaten to burn down the asylum, leaving them to their fiery demise. The food, if you could even call it that, was spoiled. The inmates were given no utensils, forcing the women to eat the rubbish like barbarians. One of Bly's experiences while there was being tied to other patients with a long leather rope that would keep 52 women bound, many sobbing and screaming. It was named Rope Gang. They would be beaten and yelled at for speaking or moving. The woman would never dare speak out to the doctors or the torturers, and the nurses would get even worse. In addition to the physical abuse, patients were often drugged. For example, sometimes when Bly couldn't sleep, the nurses made her drink a special drink to aid her in her sleep-deprived state. She was forced to drink it, but she always ended up throwing it up just so nothing peculiar got in her system. Finally, after 10 days in the madhouse, Bly was rescued from Blackwell's asylum by an attorney sent by the publishing company The New York World. Bly's first article about her experiences in the asylum was published in The New York World on October 10, 1887, two days after her release. Another article was published the following day. Her reports made headlines across the country, bringing nationwide attention to the tragedy of abuses in insane asylums. Later that year, in 1887, Bly's series of articles about her experiences was published in the book entitled 10 Days in a Madhouse. After Bly's articles were published, a New York grand jury launched an investigation into Blackwell and Island Asylum with an on-site inspection, which included Bly. The asylum was prepared for the visit and covered up many of the abuses exposed in Bly's reporting. The doctors' and nurses' stories contradicted Bly's stories, but also each other's. The grand jury's report recommended that the, the changes that Bly had proposed, along with increased budget of the Department of Public Charities and Corrections. In addition, they attempted to make the examinations to the term insanity more, though, so that only the truly mentally ill would still be admitted to the asylums. In November 1889, inspired by the popular Jules Verne book Around the World in 80 Days, Bly began a record-breaking mission of going around the world in 80 days while still reporting for the New York World. In January 1890, she completed her journey in 72 days, arriving in New Jersey to a cheering crowd. In 1885, after a short courtship, Bly secretly married a millionaire, Robert Seaman, Seaman died in 1904, leaving Bly as the principal owner of his ironclad manufacturing company. She retired from journalism for several years to run the company, but returned to reporting in 1914, serving as a war correspondent in Austria during World War I, and later covering the women's suffrage movement. Nellie Bly was still working as a journalist when she died of pneumonia in New York on January 27, 1922. Up until the late 1880s, mental health conditions in U.S. asylums were often harsh and abusive. Nellie Bly's undercover investigation of Blackwell Asylum helped turn a tragedy into a triumph by exposing Blackwell's asylum for the abusive place it was. Bly's reporting on conditions in Blackwell shocked the nation's readers and led to a newfound pressure to inspect conditions and practices of asylums across the nation. This new spotlight on mental health continued in the following years and still continues today. Nellie Bly's reporting also served to popularize investigative journalism and to open the door for women to journalism and other careers normally held by men. Nellie Bly once said, energy rightly applied and directed will accomplish anything. 